biết rồi để thành nhiều lúc có thấy cho anh rảnh để sạch sáng ưa đầm trước đứa sao đứa này cực, cực dễ sợ rất mà còn ưa đầm như đó đi Thôi cái đây rất sợ trễ làm nữa Tại... Tao có nhớ ăn nhớ ngồi trường đâu có ăn đâu ăn sáng, sáng nó ra nó ăn sáng chứ tự mà anh chịu chỉ có từng tư mới có anh chịu thì chết từ nhà nước thì người ta anh chịu đúng rồi lần này về để ít đi làm nghe chưa để dành nhiều quá làm lại từ đào đây dạ đây vừa rồi làm xong gì đỡ đúng không chị đỡ lắm, ừ, đỡ lắm ngon bác đi ra đi bay tới đón rồi con kìa nghe chỉ 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 đồ chỉ cạp đồ trên xe để cho bán tự lái đi tiếng của xe rồi Đổi chị cái kim bây giờ ơi Mở ra cám sẵn cho chị luôn Chụp ra nó
thấy Ê, cái chuyện qua đi Nhờ không? Chí nó ít hơn nữa chứ. Ít Tại hơn nhưng mà chị quen với cái cảm giác mà hết rồi. Cái chữ mạc là cái mình không quen chứ nữa. Trước em quay tới Nam bãi cái video luôn mà chứ nên quay cái bờ cái video chứ mới mà. tự nhiên Sao nó lên lại cái gì thấy nó có lại à, đó Mình rõ ràng rồi khải lẫn bị sưng lên là thấy nhiều à, à. chứ còn ví dụ như nếu như không sưng là chị sẽ không thấy bao nhiêu bởi vì mụn dưới da mụn này này cái cây cây này không bằng nửa được trước chứ mấy nó à. bằng nửa được trước rõ ràng ràng về em quay video ra đến video là lòi ra thôi trước quay cô mới tới nam cá là mà nam cá rưỡi là thành 55 phút chưa tính mấy phút làm thêm riêng nữa Rồi thành một tiếng Trời lòng còn có nửa tiếng chứ không Cái gì là vì gì rộn hết rồi á Cái trời chị thoáng lên á Lên cái trái tính là mình nó lấy người nó hơi vũa mạnh dạng kinh doanh chứ thì thì tiền từ ngân hàng hết chứ là sẵn không có gì hết mà nặng quá là kiện đo tò để cho dở nha không đi hả thấy bữa nay ao vượt nở hết mà có bạn đi đâu vượt <cười> vượt số nhiều thì quay ra tạo lừa đảo rồi cái người nhà nó không biết mà người bái tỷ đó mà Pickups don't exactly attract the left brain thinkers among us, and Raptor owners will want to drift it in rear drive mode, probably on the way out of the dealership parking lot. Maximum lateral acceleration is a mere 0.71 g. So why not just allow the locking diff to engage in two-wheel drive? Ford says that's not the way it works right now, but the company is always listening to its customers. So if you want a locking diff in rear drive mode, petition your local Ford representative. What do we want? Roosty drifts. When do we want them? as often as possible. 
Out on the pavement, the Raptor's stopping power is, surprise, surprise, very close to that of the TRX. Halting the Raptor R requires 205 feet at 70 miles per hour and 430 feet from 100 miles per hour, both of which are slightly lengthier than the TRX's stops. The Ram betters the Ford by 7 feet from 70 miles per hour and 3 feet from 100 miles per hour. Lowe's, towering price, can't lock the rear diff in 2WD, concedes horsepower bragging rights to the TRX. If you're looking to spot a Raptor R in the wild, it won't be easy. First of all, except for its bulging hood, the Raptor R looks very much like an EcoBoost Raptor with the 37-inch tire package. The trucks at Silver Lake were also emblazoned with the graphics package that riffs on the Raptor digital mud pattern by constructing the black part of the graphic out of tiny eights. On the driver's side of the truck, the Raptor logo renders the second R in Raptor orange, which looks great unless the truck is the same color, in which case it looks like you're driving a Rapto. On the passenger's side, the first R is orange, so on that side you've got an Opter. But you can delete the graphics for no cost if you prefer to let the 5.2 liter Predator speak for itself. Which, at wide open throttle, it does at an 83 decibel bellow, the same number we measured from a certain other supercharged 4x4 mega pickup. There also won't be a million Raptor RS to spot, given that the base price is a cool $109,145. Whether that roughly $30,000 more than a base Raptor, and $26,000 more than a TRX, sounds worth it or totally ridiculous depends on your point of view, and maybe whether your neighbor has a TRX and is overdue for a FOMO co repost to those 6am Hellcat cold starts. It's tempting to conclude that since Ram built the TRX and Ford built the Raptor R, that's where this ends, but we suspect not. GM, what say you? Our 2022 Kia Carnival proved useful and really darn nice. 40,000 mile wrap up. Kia's overall excellence is becoming so pervasive that even its products in dwindling segments, like minivans, are now among the class leaders. Many automakers killed off their people haulers years ago in favor of three-row SUVs. Kia has a great one of those, too, in the 10 best winning Telluride, but still chose to re-up its van for a fourth generation for 2022. It even christened it with a new name, Carnival, to replace the old Sedona moniker. As minivan connoisseurs ourselves, we promptly ordered one up for a 40,000-mile test. Slightly more than a year later, we can report that the Kia Carnival not only lives up to expectations for the sliding door species but also continues to cement Kia's newfound reputation for building desirable, high-quality, and functional vehicles, no matter the form they take. Wanting to test out all the gadgets and gizmos the Carnival has to offer, we chose a loaded SX Prestige model. Finished in $495 Astra Blue paint, our van stickered for $49,000 and included a tow hitch and roof rack crossbars for maximum utility. We knew we'd be doing some hauling with this van, and we did, strapping stuff to the roof on occasion and even towing a small U-Haul trailer that was well under the 3,500-pound towing capacity. And, of course, we stuffed the Carnival's seven-seat interior full of our own precious cargo, frequently making use of its spacious cabin and creature comforts. We had mixed feelings about the second-row VIP lounge seats with their myriad power adjustments and leg rests. For some, they were a nice refuge, perfect for napping on road trips. Others found their operation clunky, and they robbed the third row of space for passengers. The fact that you can't remove them also proved annoying when hauling large items. Indeed, Kia appears to have listened, as it has made the VIP seats less available on the 2023 Carnival. They no longer come standard on the top trim, and eight-seat layout is the default setup, and are now a no-cost option. Our van's dual-screen rear entertainment system is also now optional rather than standard on the SX Prestige model. The Carnival matched its EPA combined rating during its stay with us, averaging 22 miles per gallon. That's perfectly fine, but our recent long-term test of a Toyota Sienna minivan, which comes only as a hybrid, has shown us that there's a better way. It averaged 29 miles per gallon, offered all-wheel drive, and was only a few ticks slower than the V6-powered Carnival, which got to 60 miles per hour in 7.4 seconds at the end of its test. Would I get the Carnival instead of the Sienna that gets 50% better fuel economy, mused editor-in-chief Tony Caroga. No. But this is a nicer van. That sentiment was shared among the staff, as the Carnival's design impressed inside and out. Kia has attempted to make the minivan, with its cleverly placed C-pillar trim and a more prominent nose, look like an SUV. It doesn't entirely pull off the trick, as the Carnival still has the unmistakable sliding doors and large windows of a van, but we heard from friends that the look of this Kia could convince them to consider a minivan for the first time. Deputy video editor Carlos Lego also liked the jazzed-up cabin, with its patterned metal trim, good-looking display screens, and easy-to-use knobs for the audio system and HVAC controls. 2023 Ford F-150 Raptor R brings the V8 Fury. Update December 27, 22. This review has been updated with instrumented test results.
The day began with weather to scare Gordon Lightfoot when the gales of November came early at Michigan's Silver Lake Dunes. Eventually, the rain abetted, but the towering dunes were so thoroughly soaked that there was almost too much traction. Not too much for the guy in the rental Buick Encore, we guess, but enough to make even the steepest of dunes but a minor inconvenience to the 2023 Ford F-150 Raptor R. When you've got 700 horsepower and 37-inch beadlock tires, wet sand may as well be a foot-thick lane of interstate slab. The Raptor R is the long-awaited but maybe not inevitable zenith of the Raptor brand. In a world with no Ram TRX, would Ford drop a Shelby GT500 engine in a Raptor? Science tells us that the mere act of observation influences outcomes, and we have to think Ford observed Ram selling all the $90,000-ish trucks it could build and said, you know, maybe we should do that. And while Ram won't say how many TRXs it has sold, the Stellantis Trophy truck had a healthy head start on the Raptor R, we've already wrapped up our 40,000-mile test in our long-term TRX. On orange trucks, the orange or graphic makes it look like you're driving a Raptor. Ford. So it's a little bit curious, given the obviousness of the Raptor R's competition, that Ford didn't go for horsepower bragging rights. With the TRX making 702 horsepower, why not give the Raptor R 703? That would have been hilarious, and probably something Ram might do. Instead, Ford arrived at an even 700 horsepower at 6,650 RPM, and its powertrain engineers make complete sense when they say that you can't tell the difference between 700 horsepower and a little more than 700 horsepower. But trucks like this aren't about making sense, unless you commute to Mike Sky Ranch in Baja. They're about big numbers and loud noises and taking dirt that was over here and throwing it way over there, and then doing some sweet jumps. The Raptor R is spectacularly well equipped to handle all of that, even without horsepower bragging rights. Highs, towering off-road performance, righteous V8 sounds, quicker than a TRX. For Raptor duty, Ford's supercharged 5.2-liter V8 gets a truck tune that fattens up the torque curve, delivering 640 lbft at 4,250 rpm. The blown 5.2 gulps air so ferociously that Ford had to reinforce the Raptor's intake ductwork because the EcoBoost spec plumbing was distorting under heavy throttle. A new supercharger pulley gets the boost ramped up sooner, all the better for spinning those 437-inch BF Goodrich all-terrain KO2 tires. Because the V8 adds 100 pounds to the front end, spring rates are increased, and there are some beefier frame brackets, but the suspension mostly carries over. The base Raptor, with its 450 horsepower twin turbo 3.5 liter V6, is available with either 35 inch tires or 37s, but the Raptor Art gets only the 37s. That costs it an inch of front suspension travel, but delivers 13.1 inches of ground clearance and, Ford admits, just helps it look awesome. The 35s are rational, but the 37s say it's Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. And even though your ticket buys the whole seat, you'll only need the edge. The Raptor R, like its EcoBoost counterpart, is gloriously adaptable to whatever terrain you care to assault. The transfer case offers rear drive, auto four-wheel drive, high-range four-wheel drive, physically locked front to rear, and low-range four-wheel drive. You can also manually lock the rear differential, though not in two-wheel drive. The steering effort, Fox Live valve dampers, and exhaust sound all are independently adjustable via steering wheel buttons, which include an R button for your favorite preset modes. And there are drive modes galore to tailor responses for the situation at hand. Baja is our favorite. Wandering into tow slash haul mode occasions a shock of recognition, oh yeah, this is a truck, a useful thing that can tow and or haul. It's not just for sending the Raptor R into low orbit off Silver Lake dunes, although it's mighty good at that too. But so is an EcoBoost Raptor. Where the Raptor R distinguishes itself is when you flatten the accelerator, and the twin 4-inch exhaust cannons fire a fusillade of V8 fury, and your shoulders are buried into the Raptor R embroidery on the upper seat back while the 10-speed automatic shuffles gears quicker than a blackjack shoe rearranges the cards at the Golden Nugget. The front end climbs toward the sky, and the steering wiggles a little bit in your hands as the Raptor searches for traction. Passing power is explosive, with the towering Ford leaping from 30 to 50 miles per hour in 2.2 seconds, the same time we recorded from the 2019 Ferrari 488 Pista. Even on sand, it feels violently quick. What it feels like, really, is an F-150 Lightning extended range with way more noise and drama. The Ford engineers on hand agreed that Raptor R vs. Lightning would be a good race. But Raptor R vs. TRX is an even better one, and the Ford holds a narrow edge in acceleration tests. The Raptor R hits 60 miles per hour in just 3.6 seconds, 0.1 second ahead of the TRX, and blazes through the quarter mile in 12.0 seconds at 112 miles per hour, nipping the TRX's 12.3 second run at 111 miles per hour. And those numbers don't fully communicate the Raptor's advantage, since Ford's 114 miles per hour speed limiter begins shutting down the party before the quarter mile is complete. 
Rewind the tape and we see that at 110 miles per hour, the Raptor has a wider lead, requiring just 11.1 seconds, compared with the Ram's 11.8 seconds. Also, the Raptor lacks a launch control mode and says no to brake torquing. Instead, oddly, the quickest launches happen using the auto hold function. These two things explain why there isn't a wider gap from a truck that weighs 6,077 pounds, which is 704 pounds slimmer than the TRX. That relatively lithe curb weight didn't translate to stinginess at the pumps, though, with the Raptor are merely matching the TRX's 10 miles per gallon observed fuel economy. Given the well-watered state of the dunes, indulging our juvenile urge to throw sand required running in rear-drive mode. Which is how we discovered that, in addition to the electronic locker, there's a brake-based limited slip function for the open rear differential. The brake-based system works when one side or the other experiences a flare in wheel speed, and the brake on that side gives a squeeze to send power back to the other side. This system is operating in the background even when the advanced track stability control system is completely disabled. So if, say, you want to roost some dunes in two-wheel drive, where the rear locker can't be engaged, the rear brakes will be getting a workout. When it came time to spec, we had to have a manual. The last CTSV, the CT5V's predecessor, went automatic only, but Cadillac righted that wrong with the new car, and 62% of CT5V Blackwing buyers have chosen the DIY gearbox. Our car is a tasteful dark blue called Wave Metallic, which we would have preferred to pair with the $1,500 bronze-colored wheels rather than the bronze Brembo brake calipers it has. This car also has the $4,100 Carbon Fiber 1 package of aerodynamic add-ons, black and tan leather seats with carbon fiber seat backs, $6,090, and the $1,450 weight penalty that is the sunroof option. Between that sunroof and the iron rotors, versus the carbon ceramic option, this example weighs 115 pounds more than the first CT5V Blackwing manual we tested. Not surprisingly, this one ran 0.1 seconds slower to 60 miles per hour and through the quarter mile, although 3.7 and 11.7 seconds, respectively, is bonkers for a 4,200 pound sedan that can comfortably seat 5. At 1.02 G's, skid pad grip nearly matches that of the Corvette Z51, and the CT5V's 143-foot stopping distance from 70 miles per hour beats every C8 Corvette we've tested, proof that the Blackwing spec Michelin Pilot Sport 4S tires are considerably grippier than the off-the-shelf versions. But those numbers didn't come easily. The supercharged small block V8 that powered our car for its first 1,700 miles didn't survive the initial test session. After about 15 standing start acceleration runs, the V8 started misfiring dramatically, and the caddy left on a tow truck. Somehow, combustion got too lean on the even bank, which led to cylinder scoring and necessitated a heart transplant. We've outlined the carnage and findings from a teardown of that engine once it made its way back to GM in a separate story. Roughly six weeks later, the CT5V was back, and we started a second 1,500-mile stint of restraint to brake in the new V8, keeping engine speeds below 4,000 RPM, no wide-open throttle or constant vehicle speeds. The engine swap was covered under warranty, although we got charged $50 for fuel used to test the new engine after it was installed. Back at the track a second time, the CT5 was all bellow and zest, turning in the acceleration times mentioned above. Just when we were thinking all was right once again in CT5V Blackwing land, a cluster of deer appeared during one of our final runs, and one ran into the CT5's flank, primarily damaging the passenger's side rear door. If you thought that was unlucky, the very next day our long-term CT4V Blackwing went to the track, where it startled one of the birds feasting on the fresh kill. The bird then swooped straight into the A-pillar of the lesser Blackwing, which was going 100 plus mph. What are the odds? Months in fleet, 5 months current mileage, 5,937 miles. Average fuel economy, 15 miles per gallon. Fuel tank size, 17.4 gallons observed fuel range, 260 miles. Service, $0 normal wear, $0 repair, $50. Our long-term 2022 Cadillac CT5V Blackwing provides daily wows. 10,000 mile update. While she meant it in a much nobler context, Maya Angelou's quote nothing can dim the light which shines from within seems to apply quite well to our CT5V Blackwing. Our feverish praise for Cadillac's brightest ever four-door never wavered, although it has taken a couple pauses. Most recently, there was a $5,563 month-long pit stop to repair or replace every major passenger's side body panel and various trim pieces crinkled by a kamikaze deer during our second try at initial testing, after the engine self-destructed during the first go. But, like we said, the light from what is arguably the best sports sedan ever created isn't easily extinguished. Video maestro Carlos Lego sums up the CT5's all-around awesomeness. It's everything I could hope for or want from a daily driver sedan. Comfortable, bonkers fast, subtle looking, but also childishly loud. 
Part of the loudness is that the engine starts with an extra raspy blip during a cold start, which we enjoy every time. Our CT5 made the trip to this year's lightning lap and did a few laps of its own at Veer. To that, we'd add that this car's sizable trunk makes five-person weekend getaways possible. We don't understand, though, why there's a hands-free unlatching feature when the lid can't power itself open all the way, requiring a hand to complete the task. Our CT5 has gotten out to see more of our corner of the world, traveling to Toronto, Indianapolis, Pittsburgh, and Virginia International Raceway for this year's lightning lap, where it did a few laps of its own and earned a track outline sticker on its rump. Commenters repeatedly praised the caddy's high-speed serenity, comparing notes about how difficult it is to keep the cruising speed below three digits. And, totally unrelated, certainly, they mentioned the CT5's lack of range. While the supercharged 6.2-liter small-block V8 has gained 112 horsepower since the second-generation CTSV, the fuel tank hasn't gotten any larger. In fact, the CT5's 17.4-gallon hold is slightly less than the 18.0-gallon tank in our long-term 2011 CTSV wagon, a car that inspired similar complaints. We've crested 300 miles a few times, and the longer trips have pushed our running average fuel economy up by 2 miles per gallon to 17 miles per gallon. On highway legs, including our 75 miles per hour highway fuel economy test, we've seen as high as 22 miles per gallon, 1 mile per gallon better than the EPA highway figure, which means that theoretically a run in the high 300 mile range is possible. Although there haven't been any complaints about either the comfort or the finish of the carbon fiber back seats, the non-adjustable headrests hit tall occupants, like 6 foot 5 yours truly, well below the top of the head. BMW and Porsche are more accommodating to the tall with their fixed headrest designs. The black wing seats also creak slightly when leaned upon. We've criticized the CT5's interior trim, which is quite lowbrow for a $100,000 anything, and now a couple of stitches on the leather steering wheel have started unraveling. We have been digging the night mode, which dims all dash lights except for a minimalist speedo. This is perhaps an idea swiped from Saab, which had a similar feature called night panel. We've also completed our first service that didn't involve swapping out the entire engine. The oil filter was just $5, while each of the 8.8 .8 quarts of 0W40 cost more than three times as much, yielding a $195 total. On the way back from VIR, we had another run-in with a quadruped. This time it was a deer carcass in the middle of the interstate, hidden by darkness until it was too late to do anything but center it under the car. At every stop for the rest of that trip, we were bathed in the rank smell of warm and very bad meat, and the entrails shattered a couple of plastic underbody arrow bits and dented the oil cooler. At least putting on a set of winter tires for Michigan's cold season should be easy. Right? But just as with our CT4V Blackwing, we struggled extensively to source tires in the CT5 sizes. After exhausting all the usual outlets, we found a hodgepodge set at a local Mercedes-Benz dealer. All four are Pirelli Sada Zero Serie 2s, but the fronts are Mercedes Spec Winter 270s, and also five years old, while the rears are Porsche Spec Winter 240s. That's a lot of caveats when shelling out $1,830 for tires. We also removed the low-hanging brake cooling ducts before snow has a chance to do that for us. The unavailability of tires will hopefully provide sufficient motivation for restraint. There's so much torque all over the CT5's Tatch that this heroic V8 makes quick work of the standard 305-width Michelin Pilot Sport 4S summer pelts, so you can be up a gear or two and these squishy Pirelli still don't stand a chance. We are equal parts in awe and in love. Months in fleet. 9 months current mileage, 14,672 miles. Average fuel economy, 17 miles per gallon. Fuel tank size, 17.4 gallons observed fuel range, 290 miles. Service, $195 normal wear, $16 repair, $50 damage and destruction, $5,563. Introduction. It's been unforgettable since day one. Despite our fully respecting the break-in restrictions, the CT5V Blackwing forcefully blew off its tires in a fit of wheel spin on its first drive home in our long-term fleet. Sure, the conditions were chilly and wet, but the amount of hooliganism at the ready, even when using well shy of this car's full 668 horsepower, can almost seem reckless. That is, if the CT5V weren't so communicative, predictable, and controllable, making it easy to ease past the limit without losing the handle but we didn't yet know the breadth of emotions that Cadillac's V8 Sports sedan would quickly sear into our memory during this long-term test. After the CT5V Blackwing ran with far more expensive four doors at our lighting lap track showdown, and after we named each of Cadillac's Blackwings to our 2022 10 best list, we ordered up both for a long-term test so we could hang on to some of the best driving sports sedans ever created for as long as possible. Not much went wrong with our carnival, but its scheduled maintenance costs did total a relatively high $1,091, and Kia doesn't offer complimentary maintenance like some of its rivals do. 
The only actual issues we had with the van included a blown speaker, which was replaced under warranty, and a damaged mud flap. That one was our fault, and we replaced it for $86. We also equipped the Carnival with Nokian Outpost APT tires for the winter months. These so-called all-weather tires are meant to offer better snow performance than all seasons, but aren't quite the same as full-on winter tires. They were just fine for traversing slippery conditions, but we occasionally found them to be noisy on dry roads. Based on our experience with the Carnival, we've reaffirmed our belief that many three-row SUV buyers would be better served by minivans. While we still like the Telluride a whole lot, the Carnival is considerably more spacious inside and offers a lot of bang for your buck, especially now that Kia has raised prices considerably on the 2023 Telluride. We loved having the Carnival around, and there's now a sad, minivan-shaped hole in our long-term fleet that will be tough to fill. 30,000 mile update. Now that the Toyota Sienna has finished its 40,000 mile stay with us, the Kia Carnival is the sole minivan doing duty in our fleet. Granted, Kia's three-row Sorento SUV has joined the C-slash-D garage, but its smaller cabin and lack of sliding doors only serve to remind us that you can't beat a minivan for passenger comfort and versatility. And so, we continue to put the Carnival to good use as we approach the last quarter of our long-term test, with the Kia flying past the 30,000 mile mark this summer thanks to a steady diet of road trips. Over the summer, the Carnival shuttled assorted staffers and their 93-year-old grandparents, pregnant siblings, and friends. It also went camping at the Bonnaroo Music and Arts Festival in Tennessee. It has garnered praise for its smooth ride, quiet interior, and comfortable seats, but a few small niggles have cropped up. It can be difficult to raise the heavy third-row seats from the well on the floor that they fold into. More mechanical assistance would be appreciated. And the steering wheel controls strike us as counterintuitive. When listening to music, for example, instead of pressing the up arrow to go to the next track, you press down. The carnival is so good that tiny issues like this stand out. In previous updates, we mentioned the carnival's optional $360 roof rail crossbars and their effect on the van's fuel economy. And we now have more data to support the hypothesis that the bars hurt highway MPG when installed. We performed our 75 miles per hour highway fuel economy test once again but with the crossbars removed, and saw a big difference, the Carnival without the bars achieved 28 miles per gallon, compared with 25 miles per gallon with the bars installed. Overall, our fuel economy average has continued to rise and now sits at 22 miles per gallon, matching its EPA combined estimate. Regularly scheduled maintenance has continued to be, well, regular. A service at 24,149 miles included an engine air filter replacement, a tire rotation, and an inspection. The dealership forgot to perform an oil change, so we went back a few days later for that. The total came to $185. The dealership also replaced a blown right front speaker under warranty, and at 26,278 miles we replaced a damaged rear mud flap for $86 after waiting a few weeks for the part to come in. With only a few thousand miles left in its test, our Carnival SX Prestige will soon depart, and we'll be sad to see it go. Keep an eye out for a full recap of its 40,000 mile stay within the next few months. Months in fleet, 11 months current mileage, 34,191 miles. Average fuel economy, 22 miles per gallon. Fuel tank size, 19.0 gallons observed fuel range, 410 miles. Service, $464 normal wear, $0 repair, $0. Damage and destruction, $86. 20,000 mile update. It's only been a few months since we last checked in with our 2022 Kia Carnival, but it has already accumulated another 10,000 miles and blown past the halfway point of its 40,000 mile evaluation. And those miles haven't been easy on our Kia minivan, as we made use of its towing capacity for the first time and added Tennessee, North Carolina, Vermont, and Florida to its list of road trip destinations. The Carnival's biggest task lately was to tow a U-Haul trailer full of stuff from Michigan to New York, which it handled admirably. The Kia's stable highway manners instill confidence no matter what it's pulling, and the 3.5-liter V6 didn't feel overly taxed by the extra weight. Its indicated highway fuel economy during the trek wasn't bad, hovering around 18 to 20 miles per gallon, and the 19.0-gallon fuel tank made it easy to go 300 miles between pit stops. Unladen, we're often going over 400 miles per tank, with 457 being the current maximum. Still, that is less impressive when compared with our other long-term minivan, the Toyota Sienna Hybrid, which is averaging more than 30 miles per gallon and can easily do 500 miles on a tank. Curiously, we have pumped more than 19 gallons into the Carnival's 19.0-gallon tank on two occasions, and the last miles leading up to those stops weren't exactly nail-biters. We've asked Kia if there's a reserve amount that's not accounted for in the tank size rating, and we'll report back next time. 2022 GMC Hummer EV Pickup Edition 1 is our Bring a Trailer Auction Pick of the Day. You know the drill, a new EV gets all hyped up, and a limited number of early editions sell out quickly. 
that means secondhand auctions are where you need to look if the FOMO is real for you. In this case, the 2022 GMC Hummer EV Pickup Edition 1 is all sold out, and given the $112,595 price when new, the current bid of $102,000 over on Bring a Trailer represents a discount. That, like car and driver, is part of Hearst Autos. With the auction continuing until Saturday, January 21st, we suspect the numbers will climb before it's all over. Whatever powertrain it carries, the Hummer remains a controversial vehicle. Reviewing the the 1000 horsepower, all-electric version, we once called it a definitive repost to the EVs or wimpy crowd. If you're sad you missed out on the chance to buy one of the $100,000 plus GMC Hummer EV Edition 1 monsters, time to turn that frown upside down. A 2022 GMC Hummer EV Pickup Edition 1 with about 2,000 miles on it is currently listed for auction at the site Bring a Trailer, which, like car and driver, is part of Hearst Autos. Since you can't even place an order for a new Hummer EV right now, and when you can, deliveries might not happen until 2024, second-hand sales like this are the only way to get one in your driveway anytime soon. Originally priced at $112,595, this Hummer includes all of the headline-grabbing features that GMC is packing into the over-the-top EV. Crab walk four-wheel steering, the 200.0 kilowatt-hour Ultium battery pack, underbody cameras, watts to freedom, WTF, launch control, and an infinity roof with four removable tinted glass sky panels. Three motors, one in front, two on the back axle, provide a 0 to 60 mph time of approximately 3 seconds when the WTF mode is engaged. Super Cruise, an extreme off-road package, Bose Audio, 18-inch wheels, and a multi-pro tailgate are all included. Once GMC opens up Hummer EV orders again, you could spec a new one to have similar specs to the Edition 1, but some features are exclusive to this model, like an Edition 1 badge. The contrasting interstellar white exterior paints and jet black and light gray faux leather interior also identify it as an Edition 1 model. This 2022 GMC Hummer EV is located in Washington State and has a clean title. It has had only one owner and a clean Carfax report. The seller is including a travel battery charger with 110V and 220V connectors and a home charging unit. 759 HP 2023 Aston Martin DBS 770 Ultimate is a limited run swan song. Aston Martin is retiring the current gen DBS with a bang, revealing the DBS 770 Ultimate in a limited edition of 499. Aston calls this its most powerful production car ever, thanks to a 759 horsepower 5.2 liter V12. The special car, which is already sold out, is part of the company's celebration of 110 years since it was founded on January 15, 1913. It is priced at the equivalent of $387,600 for the coupe and $415,960 for the convertible, Aston said. Update January 18, 23, added acceleration figures. If this is your first time hearing about the Aston Martin DBS 770 Ultimate, you're already too late. To celebrate the end of the current generation DBS, Gaiden has whipped up quite the barnstormer, only 499 of which will be built and all of which are already reserved. You snooze, you lose. It's one hell of a swan song too, in fact, Aston Martin says the DBS 770 Ultimate is the most powerful production car the automaker has ever produced. Under that long hood is a 5.2 liter V12 engine producing 759 horsepower and 664 pound-feet of torque, which is delivered to the rear wheels through a ZF-built 8-speed automatic transmission and a standard mechanical limited slip differential. Aston Martin claims all this power is good for a 3.2-second hustle to 60 miles per hour, although the convertible takes an extra 0.2 seconds to reach the same speed. Top speed is a suitable 211 miles per hour. Aston Martin didn't just jack up the boost pressure and call it a day. While it does use the same carbon ceramic brakes as the standard DBS, a whole raft of updates under the skin should boost its handling prowess as well. A beefier front crossmember and rear undertray boost overall torsional stiffness by 3%, while front and lateral stiffness is up by 25%. A new solid-mounted steering column should bestow the driver with some additional feel, and the adaptive dampers carry unique tuning too. If the FOMO hasn't already crept in, it will as soon as you see a DBS 770 Ultimate roll by. It is handily the sharpest DBS variant on the block. Tweaks to the bumpers bring an angrier look alongside additional airflow, and that focus on aerodynamics continues by way of a massive horseshoe-shaped vent on the clamshell hood. There's also a flashy new set of 21-inch wheels, available in three finishes and wrapped in Pirelli P0 Performance Summer Tires. The DBS's interior was already pretty radical, but Aston Martin has kicked things up a notch for this final edition. Standard sport seats include semi-aniline leather and uniquely quilted Alcantara. The center armrest gets a cute little leather strap with a laser-etched badge carrying the DBS 770 Ultimate logo. The model designation can also be found on the Doorsill plaques. 
Of course, any owner can go above and beyond what's seen here, thanks to Aston Martin's Q Bespoke Services, which can add all manner of clever graphics and paint colors into the build. The 2023 Aston Martin DBS 770 Ultimate will be limited to 499 units, split between 300 coupes and 199 convertibles, with production starting in the first quarter of this year and deliveries happening in the third. Unless you're waiting for one to pop up on Bring a Trailer, you're out of luck because the order books are already closed. The base engine will remain a 147 horsepower 2.0 liter inline 4 paired with a continuously variable automatic transmission. A more powerful turbocharged 1.6 liter inline 4 will be available, likely on the sportier inline model, and produces the same 195 horsepower and 195 pound feet of torque as before. Hyundai has yet to confirm the transmission for this model, but it previously used a 7-speed dual-clutch automatic. We're hoping that the raucous 286-horsepower Kona and performance model will stick around, too, but we may have to wait a little longer for more information on that. There's also a Kona hybrid, but we're not sure if it'll be sold in the U.S. or not. Its powertrain, which consists of a 1.6-liter gasoline engine and an electric motor and produces a total of 139 horsepower, appears to be the same as what's offered in the Kia Niro. A Kona electric model will also return, but specs aren't yet available for that. In terms of size, the new 2024 Kona is bigger than before, with a 2.3-inch longer wheelbase and a 5.7-inch longer overall length. Hyundai says this improves rear seat room and cargo space. A few additional photos of the interior show the dual 12.3-inch display screens that will be offered, likely only on higher trim levels. Holy Ton Ale New 2024 Alfa Romeo Ton Ale SUV starts at $44,590. The 2024 Alfa Romeo Ton Ale Small SUV is the company's first plug-in hybrid. Pricing starts at $44,590 for the entry-level Ton Ale Sprint, while the fully loaded version starts at $49,090. The mid-level T-Trim and Top Veloce are available for pre-order today, with the Sprint ready later this spring. Every ton ale comes with a plug-in hybrid powertrain that uses a turbocharged 1.3-liter inline-4 engine and produces 285 horsepower. All-wheel drive is also standard. The Italian-built 2024 Alfa Romeo ton ale is coming to shake some Italian seasoning on the subcompact luxury crossover segment that's filled largely with German offerings such as the Audi Q3, the BMW X1, and the Mercedes-Benz GLA class. Available today for pre-order, we now know pricing for the new Alfa SUV but its entry-level trim won't become available until sometime this spring. The Ton Ale is Alfa Romeo's first plug-in hybrid and is a small SUV that slots in below the Stelvio. It shares its platform with the Jeep Compass but is more closely related to the upcoming Dodge Hornet that also goes on sale later this year. While every Ton Ale gets the same 285 horsepower turbocharged 1.3-liter inline-four plug-in hybrid powertrain with a 9-speed automatic and all-wheel drive, the crossover's options are split among three trim levels. Only the top two trims, Veloce and T, are available for pre-order today. The Ton Ale is currently eligible for the $7,500 federal EV tax credit. Ton Ale Sprint starts at $44,590 and serves as the entry point for the Mini Alfa Romeo. It comes with an impressive list of standard equipment such as silver 18-inch wheels, keyless entry and ignition, remote start, heated cloth seats, and a heated steering wheel. A 10.3-inch infotainment touchscreen with Apple CarPlay and Android Auto are also standard. There's even wireless smartphone charging. The Ton LT pricing starts at $46,590, only a few thousand bucks more than the entry trim, and adds subtle appearance changes like black wheels and other exterior accents but also includes a power lift gate and ambient lighting. At the top of the Ton food chain is the Veloce at $49,090. While the trim level means Italian for fast, it doesn't actually have an advantage in power. But it should feel livelier thanks to its larger 19-inch wheels, Brembo brake calipers, and a sporty adaptive suspension. The Veloce has the nicest interior of the bunch, with perforated leather seats and synthetic suede upholstery, and it's the only way to get paddle shifters. While its commanding starting price does give it a bigger price tag than other plug-in hybrids such as the Ford Escape PHEV, Toyota RAV4 Prime, and Hyundai Santa Fe PHEV, it has more horsepower than other gas-only crossovers its size. Alpha hopes that its beautiful Italian design and richly equipped standard features will win hearts. 2024 Mercedes-Benz CLA gets new looks, electrified powertrain. Mercedes revealed the 2024 CLA lineup, previewing newly styled front and rear ends, restyled headlights, and new wheel options. Peak output stays at 221 horsepower, but a newly electrified powertrain adds 13 horsepower to bring peak power lower in the range. There's no word on official pricing yet, but Mercedes expects the new CLA to start arriving at dealerships later in 2023. 
Mercedes isn't quite ready to give the CLA a full redesign, but instead is offering a slight facelift to please fans of the compact four-door. Along with it comes a newly electrified powertrain. The 2024 model gains a 48-volt hybrid system to help with acceleration. In the low end of the rev range, it adds a power boost of 13 extra horsepower. During braking and acceleration, the starter generator recuperates energy, which it then uses to supply the 12-volt onboard network in the 48-volt hybrid system with electrical energy. The system appears to work similarly to the hybrid system in the Mercedes-AMG SL43, which utilizes a belt-driven starter generator to boost horsepower at lower RPM. The CLA's looks are updated at both front and rear, although changes are minimal. The front fascia gets new shaping, and the grille swaps its old speckled dot design for one spangled by the Mercedes star. The biggest visual changes are redesigned headlights and taillights, which drop the lower portion of the daytime running lights. There are two new color options, Hyper Blue, which is exclusive to CLA models, and Starling Blue. Three new wheel designs also join the lineup. The AMG Wing cooked up its own series of revisions and upgrades for the AMG CLA 35 and CLA 45 models, which sport a new AMG-specific front end. Opting for the AMG Aerodynamics Package Plus adds a fixed rear spoiler. Output in the AMG CLA 35 stays put at 302 horsepower, though it receives the same 13 horsepower boost as the non-AMG variants. The AMG CLA 45S is a different story, with power increasing by 34 horsepower to an impressive total of 416. According to Mercedes, the AMG CLA 45S can sprint to 60 miles per hour in 4.0 seconds. Inside the CLA, the standard display has grown, with a 10.3-inch instrument cluster and a 10.3-inch touchscreen, both running the newest MBUX infotainment system. One of the features is a choice of three display styles, the fully informative classic, a sporty version with a dynamic tachometer, and the minimalist discrete setting. Wireless Apple CarPlay and Android Auto have both been added, and there are new trim levels, with a choice of carbon, open pore wood, or in an AMG-exclusive brown microfiber option. Stepping up to the AMG line brings the number of interior upholstery options from 3 to 5, adding two-tone color schemes into the mix. Standard safety systems have been updated as well, providing customers with parking assist and a mirror package. Mercedes has not offered any word on pricing yet, but said it expects to have CLA models arriving at U.S. dealerships later in 2023. This content is imported from Poll. You may be able to find the same content in another format, or you may be able to find more information at their website. 2024 Hyundai Kona will grow larger but doesn't gain power. Hyundai has revealed more specs for the redesigned 2024 Kona. It features carryover engines and offers a hybrid variant, which hasn't yet been confirmed for the U.S. We expect the Kona to go on sale here later this year, although we're still waiting on U.S. details. Hyundai's new 2024 Kona looks a whole lot different than before, but doesn't appear to be as revolutionary underneath. Specs for the new model are out, and the subcompact SUV's engine choices, a naturally aspirated 2.0-liter inline-four and a turbocharged 1.6-liter inline-four, carry over from the outgoing model. We're still waiting on details for the U.S. model, which will confirm whether the Kona's hybrid model will make its way to our shores. 2023 BMW X1 is practical, not experimental. Update December 29th, 22, this review has been updated with test results. Despite a name shared with a rocket-powered aircraft, there's little chance of mixing up BMW's X1 with Bells. We're sure Chuck Yeager would have appreciated such luxuries as interior mood lighting and the option of a Bang & Harman slash Cardin 12 speaker stereo. Unlike his radical experimental plane, the BMW X1 is a pleasant small SUV that offers an attractive entry point to German brand motoring. And it isn't breaking barriers or speed records, even if you dropped it from the belly of a B29. BMW's Skunk Works have recently been experimenting with dramatic design elements inside and out. The X1 is a more traditional offering with a smooth exterior and a small, almost square kidney grille, understated next to the flared nostrils of most of the current BMW lineup. Still BMW's smallest SUV, the X1 has grown to nearly the size of a first-generation BMW X3, now in its third iteration since its 2009 introduction, the UDA is 1.7 inches longer and taller, and it's almost an inch wider than last year's all-wheel drive equivalent. The wheelbase is 0.9 inch longer, and the track width is greater by 0.8 inch. The result is more interior room and a hint of bulldog stance. A revised engine and a new transmission. Under the hood is a good old gas burner, a turbocharged 2.0-liter Miller Cycle four-cylinder with a few extra horses squeezed in. An electric version, the 9-1, is available in other markets but won't come here. Changes to the combustion chamber geometry and the new port and direct injection system bump the power plant to 241 horsepower, from 228, and 295 pound-feet of torque. 
In our testing, the X-1 at full thrust reached 60 miles per hour in 5.4 seconds and covered the quarter mile in 14.1 seconds at 99 miles per hour. Replacing the previous 8-speed automatic, a 7-speed dual-clutch gearbox has a wider ratio spread and allows coasting. If you want it on high alert for grabbing gears, the Sport mode shifts with more vigor, and the M Sport package, $2,300, provides paddle shifters that put the decision-making in the driver's hands. We found the powertrain to be quiet and smooth in traffic and highway cruising but a bit sluggish when asked to make high-speed passes or accelerate uphill, despite the X1's reasonably zippy 4.3 second 50 to 70 mph passing time. There's some turbo lag to be found here, even in sport mode, which helped contribute to a relatively pokey 6.6 second pull from 5 to 60 miles per hour. EPA fuel economy estimates are 28 miles per gallon combined, 25 miles per gallon city, and 34 MPG highway, which are some 2 to 3 miles per gallon better than last year's all-wheel drive model. Running the X1 hard through Southern California's mountain roads, we averaged only 23 miles per gallon, though. One big change to the X1 for 2023 is that all-wheel drive is now standard. During easy motoring, the front wheels handle the majority of driving duties, but any loss of traction sends power to the rear. Dynamically, the X1 is fun to drive, scooting happily around corners. Its small size makes it well-matched for narrow roads, and, when you're done, narrow parking spots. Neither the steering wheel nor the brake pedal offers much feedback. Even so, on its optional 20-inch summer tires, our test car needed 167 feet to stop from 70 miles per hour and generated 0.86 g of grip on the skid pad. Interior style and tech. BMW has been on it with interior design in its new models. The X1's cabin makes good use of texture and color to add interest to swaths of plastic. The door panels in particular are appealing, pretty enough that you might leave the door open a few extra minutes so your neighbors can admire the Tweety pattern speaker grills and the gateway arch of a door handle. The console offers a lower shelf space, although it's not easy to access with a larger handbag. Cup holders sit low and out of the way, and the optional wireless charging pad leans back at the angle of a grandpa in a barkalonger, a nod to those of us who sneak a look at the screen at stoplights. Speaking of screens, the X1 single curved display panel runs from behind the steering wheel to the center of the dash. Modes offer different instrumentation designs, and the right side showcases navigation, music, and phone interfaces. Unfortunately, the screen is also the only way to control the climate system and the seat heaters, and it's a long stretch for the driver, even for those of us sitting far forward. The sound system can be adjusted from the steering wheel, but to turn off the heated steering wheel or adjust the AC fan, you have to do some poking around on screen, never an ideal action while driving. The seats in our sample car were the optional sport seats. For a commuter SUV, they're deeply bolstered. While the seating position was good and highly adjustable, the cushioning was too firm for a long drive, a scenario in which the bones in one's posterior will quickly make themselves known. The rear seats are also stiff, and passengers may find the backrest angle too reclined, although the laid-back shape does make installing a child seat easier. Cargo space is generous, with a side net to corral small objects, a total of 26 cubic feet behind the rear seats, and 57 with them folded. X1 Pricing and Equipment Shopping for an X1 should be relatively easy, as there are no alternative engine or transmission choices, and the standard model comes with many features you'd want, including Apple CarPlay and Android Auto compatibility, LED headlights with cornering lights, a power lift gate, and roof rails. The X-Line package adds bigger wheels and more interesting interior trim, and a sunroof is available with either the convenience package, $1,950, or the premium package, $4,200. Nudging the price up from the $39,595 starting point is pretty easy, and our $50,795 example packs a lot into a small SUV. It may not be Chuck Yeager's glamorous Glennis, but even an experimental test pilot could use a practical runabout when it's time to hang up the flight suit and drive home. Kia doesn't price its vehicles as aggressively as it used to, but the starting points for the new Sportage, $27,615 for the base LX model up to $38,415 for a X-Pro Prestige, fall into a competitive range for compact crossovers. We'd be reluctant to pay close to $40,000 for a version like the two we tested, a $38,310 SX Prestige Hybrid and a $39,075 X-Pro Prestige with the base engine, the X-Pro can't be had with the hybrid powertrain. But a nicely equipped EX Hybrid in the mid dollar 30 k range strikes us as an attractive proposition, distinctive styling and all. 2022 Mercedes-Benz EQS 450 Plus electrifies luxury. Update January 3rd, 23. This review has been updated with test results. After you've driven nearly every car for sale over the last 20 years, it's natural for the cars of the past to enter into your thoughts when driving something new. 
Humans compare experiences to gain perspective, which explains why we were daydreaming about Rolls Royces while driving Mercedes-Benz's new electric luxury four-door, the EQS 450 Plus. Like a Rolls Royce Phantom, the EQS is a capsule of luxury and silence that pours itself down the road with unerring grace. Unlike a hard-to-swallow Rolls, the EQS looks like an Advil leaky gel. It's a lozenge of a car with what Mercedes claims is the lowest drag coefficient, 0.20, of any car on sale. That slick bod whips through the air, barely disturbing it, and leads to near silence at extra-legal highway speeds. At a more reasonable 70 miles per hour, we recorded just 64 decibels of noise inside the cabin. The 107.8 kilowatt-hour battery sandwiched in the floor assists in keeping road noise to a minimum. That big battery also allows the EQS 450 Plus to go an estimated 350 miles between charges, according to the EPA. Yet we were able to cover 400 miles on our 75 miles per hour highway test, putting this Benz just behind our current long-range EV champ, the Lucid Air Grand Touring. Find a level 3 DC hookup and the EQS can go from 10% charge to 80% in a claim 31 minutes. On a typical level 2 setup, the EQS takes just over 11 hours to go from 10% to 100%. Highs, impressive real-world range, luxurious appointments, generous cargo capacity. Moving the electrons around in the battery is a single motor driving the rear wheels that makes 329 horsepower and 417 pound-feet of torque. It's not nearly as quick as the 516 horsepower EQS 580, but it'll shove you into the massaging seats. After the initial thrust from a stop the acceleration tapers off, but 60 miles per hour is yours in 5.4 seconds. In more relaxed driving, the right now torque affords the EQS the same sort of effortless waftability that Rolls-Royce has been touting for decades. Yet what really reminds us of the spirit of ecstasy is the suppleness and silence of the suspension as it glides over the tarmac. Not much of the outside permeates the EQS's cocoon. The long 126.4-inch wheelbase certainly helps attenuate bumps, but it's the tuning of the standard air spring suspension that maintains the serenity despite our test car's 20-inch wheels wrapped in Goodyear summer rubber. Those sticky tires provide excellent grip, 0.90g around the skid pad, despite this car's 5,530-pound curb weight. Press it hard into a corner and it remains flat, and the low center of gravity born of the massive battery in the floor seemingly drills the car into the center of the earth. Steering efforts are light and don't pick up much even in sport mode, but the easy efforts help mask the heft and size of this S-class sized hatchback. Four-wheel steering turns the rear wheels up to 10 degrees in opposition of the fronts at low speeds, helping to shrink the turning circle to 35.7 feet, making this very big Benz feel like an A-class. There's an ease and luxury to the whole driving experience that is only interrupted by the brakes. Hitting the brakes in the EQS starts with energy regeneration from the motors and then blends in the stopping power of the four massive brake rotors. Stepping into the brake pedal is an initially mushy experience that doesn't slow the car much. Keep pushing and you reach a hard point where the pedal resists being moved farther. Press harder and the deceleration finally hits, but it takes a lot of pedal pressure to get meaningful braking, and by then you're sailing toward that burgundy Corolla at an alarming rate. Give yourself considerably more space than the 167 feet it takes to stop from 70 miles per hour and 351 feet from 100 miles per hour. 2023 Kia Sportage leads with bold styling. Update January 12th, 23. This story has been updated with test results. Given the smashing success that is the Kia Telluride, it might have been smart for Kia's designers to simply scale down that three-row SUV squared-off looks when it came time to redesign the brand's smaller crossovers. But the latest generation of the mid-size Sorento doesn't stick to that template, nor does the new 2023 Sportage, which brings a distinctive look to the compact segment. Whether you'll be a fan of the Sportage's design is another story. We won't call it ugly, but its face is somewhat polarizing. With boomerang-shaped accent lights, low-mounted headlights, and a wide-mouth grille, the front end makes a strong statement. What exactly that statement is, we'll leave up to you. The rear end is a bit more cohesive, with smooth surfaces and taillights that remind us of the handsome units on the Kia EV6. The Sportage surely won't be mistaken for its corporate sibling, the Hyundai Tucson, which also looks striking for a mainstream crossover. The Sportage is not all about form, though. Significantly larger than its predecessor in length, wheelbase, and many other dimensions, the new model is on the big end of the compact SUV spectrum. It doesn't offer a third row of seats like the Volkswagen Tiguan and the Mitsubishi Outlander, but a 3.4-inch increase in wheelbase greatly expands its rear seat and cargo space. We like how the rear seats slide and recline, and the Sportage's 40 cubic feet of cargo volume behind the second row just edges out what the Honda CR-V offers. Highs, spacious interior, lots of features and options, good ride quality. This Kia's interior trappings also are nicer than that Honda's. 
Upper trim sportage models have two integrated 12.3-inch display screens in front of the driver, one for the digital gauge cluster and the other for infotainment. Both screens have bright, crisp graphics, and the dashboard's various materials are pleasant to the touch where it counts, and still nicely grain-hard plastic where it doesn't. Another screen down on the center stack is flanked by two physical knobs that can display either haptic climate control buttons or a row of navigation and audio controls. The functions of those two knobs can also change depending on inputs, which is a neat feature but not necessarily a convenient one when you reach down to adjust the volume and realize the knob is currently set for temperature control. More knobs and buttons reside on the center console to manage everything from the optional heated and ventilated seats, an EX model we drove had glaringly blank buttons for the ventilated seats it wasn't equipped with, to the various drive modes and off-road settings, such as hill descent control and the ability to lock in the all-wheel drive system. Like basically every other crossover maker these days, Kia is touting its vehicle's capability in the dirt, and it's now offering the Sportage and X-Pro trim with all-terrain tires and some rugged-looking visual tweaks.